I've got a rich friend who spends his money on stupid stuff. I'm not sure how he's still rich, to be honest. I didn't even know you could do this, but he bought a leisure submarine for half a million dollars and invited me out to Vancouver to take it for a spin. He owns a luxury yacht that I'd been on before, and I didn't realize it had a submarine bay, which is part of what inspired this purchase. He mentioned to me that somewhere out in the middle of the Pacific, he'd seen a bunch of shipwrecks through the water that were too low to dive down to, and he really wanted to check them out. I had to admit, that sounded like fun. The model he bought was capable of reaching a depth of a thousand meters, or just over three thousand feet, and he wasn't sure, but he estimated that the wrecks he'd seen were about five hundred to seven hundred meters down, a relatively shallow part of the ocean, of course. He brought a couple other buddies along on the yacht, guys that I didn't know very well, but the sub only held two people and he promised me that I could drive it first. Everyone on board was pretty fun, and it was a real party as we sailed for three days out to the spot. Although only two people could be in the sub at once, it had a built-in front-facing camera which was capable of live-streaming to the TV in the yacht's rec room, and the party gathered around to watch it. As my rich friend, Jim, and I entered the sub, I felt a bit overwhelmed with all the buttons and knobs and underprepared to pilot this thing. But Jim had had a few lessons, and he was excited to show me. We took off from the sub bay, slapping against the water, and slowly began submerging. The water was crystal clear, and the sights were breathtaking. There was a maximum speed at which we could submerge safely, but I could rotate the sub around so that the people watching in the rec room could get a taste of what we were seeing. I could hear them cheering in my ears, still mostly pretty drunk. There were millions of colorful schools of fish fish and jellyfish. A couple small sharks floated around as well. I felt very glad not to be diving, even though they were probably harmless. When we finally arrived at the first shipwreck, it looked even more hauntingly beautiful than it had from above. Jim's estimate of the depth had been pretty good. We were about 650 meters down. Much of the natural lighting had died at this depth, and the sub's lighting was coming in handy. There was something mildly disturbing about looking at a shipwreck as it lay on the bottom of the ocean. Maybe I'd seen too many horror movies, but I kept expecting a half-decomposed dead sailor to slam into the glass in front of us. The first ship appeared to be made almost entirely out of wood, now rotten of course, covered in algae and barnacles and other strange things. We glided silently over the bow and along the deck. Even in the rec room they were silent, watching what we were seeing. The ship appeared to be cracked in half, and the stern sat about 10 meters away. It was kind of helpful, because we could see a cross-section into the ship, but to my surprise it appeared completely barren. No furniture or devices, perhaps it had been scattered by the currents. All that remained was the hull. Something big caught my attention on the right side of my periphery. I turned the sub quickly and kicked up a bit of sand from the ocean floor. Through the freshly awakened haze, I could see a massive creature. It had a brown body and white polka dots. Oh my god, Jim remarked. That's a whale shark. There were gasps of amazement in my ears from the viewing party on the surface. I was terrified. At the time, I didn't know they were harmless. I just thought of it as the largest shark I had ever seen. It glided past the shipwreck and went off on its own, disappearing. Jim wanted to check out the next ship. It looked a lot more modern, but it was about a kilometer away. I turned the sub and we threaded the space between the broken bow and stern to travel along the starboard side. I can't believe I hadn't noticed it until now, but the sea floor where we were floating dropped off significantly into a large, deep void. Pointing the sub's light down it, I couldn't see the bottom. It became a lot murkier too, a much more eerie darkness. There was something vibrating down there, something that was rocking the sub the closer to the edge of the shelf we got. I did my best to ignore it and pointed the sub's light straight ahead once more to see the wreck in the distance. A heavy current flying up from the depths on the left knocked us off course, and a great bellow was sounding through the water. I was alarmed and Jim shone the sub's light down into the ravine. There was something moving by along the ravine at breakneck speeds. It was green, 
and scaled and larger than any creature I knew to exist. It looked like a serpent, but it was a hundred meters wide. That's right, three times the length of the longest aquatic dinosaur. It didn't cease. It just kept swimming extremely fast, and its body just kept appearing. I could feel the current starting to suck us in towards it. My brain couldn't allow me to believe this was a living creature. It had to have been some secret government machine. I turned the sub around and got as far away from the ledge as I could. Jim was yelling at me. The people in my ear were yelling at me. They wanted a closer look, but I wasn't an idiot. I had had enough. Something that size would be able to swallow not just the sub, but the yacht, and by accident. I began my slow ascent, and Jim kept calling me a coward, saying really toxic things, and it really made me question our friendship. I yelled something at him, although I don't remember what it was, but it was something along the lines of me being done with this and wanting to return to the boat. He stayed quietly angry with me through the rest of the ascent, and when we made it back to the yacht, another one of his buddies jumped in as I hopped out. I went to my room and changed my clothes because I had sweat in these pretty hard, then joined the rest of the guests in the rec room as they watched the descent once more with Jim at the wheel. Jim was ignoring the shipwrecks this time and had the light of the sub pointed at the abyss below that shelf. A couple people in the rec room were agreeing with me that it didn't look safe and that I made the right call. I didn't really care and I didn't feel entertained by this, but I couldn't look away out of fear for my friend's safety. The sub reached the sand shelf and then kept descending, and sure enough, there was some panic over the intercom as Jim and his buddy got swept up in the current. On the camera, it appeared that the monster's long body was decreasing in girth as it continued to slither through the ocean. It may have been coming to a tail, and just as Jim and his buddy were pulled directly into the serpent's path, its tail disappeared into the darkness. They had reached the next layer of seafloor, this one at about a thousand meters down, the submarine's limit. Many of the idiots in the room with me were cheering and clapping, as were Jim and his buddy down in the sub. Jim turned the sub and began exploring the direction opposite to the path taken by the creature. He mocked me over the intercom, even though just moments ago I know he had been pissing his pants. He kept talking about what an amazing discovery it had been. He was certainly right about that. I don't know how what was easily the largest creature on Earth had gone undetected for so long. The sound on the intercom became choppy, and there was another deep bellow similar to what I had heard when I was down there. On the submarine camera, two yellow lights about a hundred meters apart appeared. They were approaching the submarine quickly. I only saw it for a moment, the face of the enormous serpent, its glowing yellow eyes at the sides of its head like a fish. Its colossal mouth and dull teeth were splayed open dumbly, sucking water into its great maw it engulfed the sub. It was impossible to tell what was going on as the sub tumbled. There was the sound of metal crinkling and glass smashing, and then the light went out and the sound stopped. The viewing party went silent where we all sat in the rec room of the yacht. Someone got on a radio and began calling for help, but I knew there was no helping. That serpent was just on an unstoppable path, and it just kept going round and round. Even a year later, after so many of us have reported it and testified and asked for help in the search, we've gotten very little interest from the authorities above us. A part of me thinks that they know it's there. Maybe it's necessary. Maybe it holds the oceans in place. Hey guys, thanks for listening to that story. This was another request who wanted one about a sea serpent, and I decided to do one on Jormungand, which of course from Norse mythology is the serpent that encircles the world and holds the ocean in place. In Norse mythology, a hundred meters wide would probably be considered pretty small, but don't worry. Obviously, this wasn't my first story about a massive sea creature, and it won't be my last. Subscribe and hit the bell for next week's story, which will be The Cannibal. It will be an origin story story on the Wendigo, as requested. And this Sunday night at 9pm Eastern Standard Time, stop by for Nightmare Theater, which is a live show I do where I read people's nightmares. Should be a lot of fun. Until next time, embrace the beautiful dark.